more people are going to straggle in, but we're going to start because we're already a little bit behind schedule. Um, so this part of the session, uh, I know that we were going to start the debate, but I thought I'll tell you a little bit about uh, IICS, and we have a couple videos that will tell you about IICS. Uh, the sound worked a second ago, but I hope it works, of course, with a whole bunch of people watching. So let's just see. Uh, so about IICS, our students, we have about 600 students, and it's basically equal between primary and secondary. Those numbers are not hard. They fluctuate all the time. We have about 45 to 50 different nationalities. And uh, in order to come to our school, you must have a foreign passport in order, to, in order to be here. And then most of our students in this order are from the US, Korea, England, Germany, then Canada. And that's the order of uh, our greatest populations. Our teachers, we have 14 nationalities. Uh, average experience is about 14 years. I thought that was interesting when I found that out. 47% uh, or higher have master's degree. And uh, this is a little video that explains about our... Let's see. It explains about our new literacy team. <laughs> I expected this. And so I have a backup. Let's see. Sorry. What types of tools are we using? Mathletics. Uh, Twitter, Vimeo, Google Docs. We use Edmodo and Twitter because in Edmodo you can do polls, you can put up videos, and you don't have a limit of characters that you can use. So you can just go on and on and on and on. Like on Gmail when we have homework, we could like always ask our friends from the computer and it's always quicker. And you can always like email your teacher if there's any problems at that time. Mm, mathematics helps um, us with our education because it's teaching us math. And it also helps our teachers for homework. Google Docs helps us because then the teacher doesn't have to send us each individually a document. She can just send it to the whole class and we just make a copy and then we can all work on it. It helps with education because then you can all share one document and all work on it at the same time. In Moto Works, uh, we could share uh, YouTube videos or we could leave comments at, for each other to like see. Like if, we, if somebody found out that we had homework, that nobody else did. We could say today homework is blah blah blah. Well, this like a teacher didn't say what the homework was, so we could spread and comment and yeah. It helps with education if like you put up a project that you did that you didn't want your like teacher to grade yet, and you just want like normal re like reviews and how they like it and what to improve before you pass it up to a teacher. You could post it in a moto and then your friends could like comment and they could see how much they like and you could tell them and then they could tell you what to improve in, like to add another picture or to put more ideas. Twitter is a good tool to share our thoughts and uh, with Twitter you only have 104 ca 140 characters so you have to really think about what you're going to write. In GarageBand, you can use different tools. You can record on the spot or you can like import things. And it's easier than like writing a report because 
it's sometimes easier to talk than to write and you can also add like sound effects and it's really fun and go back into the presentation now. Um, okay. Uh, one thing I just wanted to talk about, in that video, uh, those are the grade four or five students who are talking, and uh, they're talking about the new literacies at our school. The new literacies, if you go to Amanda and Caroline's session this afternoon, I think that they get much more detailed uh, about what we're actually doing in the new literacies. Uh, basically, it's uh, taking the library and the tech curriculum and infusing it into uh, all of the program and the curriculum here at our school. Uh, but it's making it approachable for teachers uh, as well. So it's not a lot of tech jargon, but it is taking everything that's from NETS and it's taking the things that are from uh, the uh, PYP and the MYP and putting it all together and making it our own. But You'll explain more of that later, right? So, with the tech. In our classrooms, uh, we have data projectors and smart boards, iMacs. They're in almost every classroom, I think. We have an Ethernet connection of uh, 50 megabytes per second right now. And we have uh, students from grade 2 to 12 all will have a Google uh, account. Now, in grade 2 and 3, the email is uh, not uh, enabled. But from grade four up, uh, everything is, is social and, and they're able to talk with everyone. Uh, they use Drive and they use uh, the Google Docs and everything very, very extensively. And we use Calendar for booking things and we've set all that up. Um, here's another video. This one, before I start it, this video is, uh, I wanted to give you a clip it from what happens in elementary. We saw the middle school and then later on I have one more, or two more <coughs> videos of some fantastic work that's done in the high school. I'll try that again.
preschool prep and grade one, they're using iPads. And uh, in grade two to five, the kids are using MacBooks, but they share the MacBooks with one other student. So it's kind of a two to one MacBook program. Uh, in preschool to grade six, all the teachers use WordPress and they'll uh, have their class sites and they communicate with the parents through these sites. Um, they try not to do as much email as they used to and they feed everything this way. We actually have RSS feeds so that the uh, teachers, or sorry, the parents are able to sign up and get the emails directly to them. Um, then ECE also has Apple TV. We're using one today a little bit. Uh, you'll see in, a, in uh, the next session. <coughs> This is a video done in uh, grade 12. Okay, this is grade about some linear equations. Follow me and I'm gonna show you what the way is. Axis up and down and left to right, that's how you make them. Y intercept and gradient are steps of line creation. It is a line, I'll show you what it means. The formula is Y equals MX plus B. You're gonna learn faster if it's coming from me. Firstly, I'm gonna be taking a look at what MX means. MX can be referred to as the rise of a run. In other words, a slope and then you're halfway done. Now. This look at B, the y-intercept When the line crosses y-axis, this is what you get Now, it's time to show you how to graph the line Better be looking carefully, I'm doing this one time The x-axis is going right to left Crooked lines will leave a graph looking like one big wreck And then, we're gonna draw the axis of y If you wanna begin to do this, go from low to high So please start marking up the graph like it's a number line Make sure that negatives and positives have different sides Now, 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 now that I'm mostly done with the simple basics you're gonna learn to make a line that's based off an equation okay the y intercept in this case is the number six so please proceed to marking down this one coordinate and now draw the infamous rise of a run looking at this very example slope is two over one up by two one across up by two one across i said up by two one across and these skills will help you be a mathematical boss and now i'm gonna teach you a few tricks and steps that will really be beneficial towards your line success if the slope is negative the line goes left to right going in a downwards motion is how it's like and if the slope is positive it is the same direction however upwards left to right and then you've learned perfection i really hope you learned a lot about this math section i'll spread your teachings and start a math and Infection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> linear equations. Linear equations. Linear equations. That was my fault. Um, <laughs> so, so we were doing a. Uh, that was a ninth grader, uh, and we were we were doing uh, teacher resources. So the the project is to create a, a digital resource that a teacher can use to to better introduce a unit, or to uh, as an exemplar of a final task. And we study about um, learning styles and whether or not students learn better uh, if we're talking about kinesthetic learning or. Um, you know, through videos or what, what audio. Did he use for that? Um, so he he just used iMovie on that. Okay. So, um, and what was his name? Uh, Daniel Okabe. Yeah. He's a really gifted uh, student in in digital video anyway, but uh, he, he kind of showed off his skills. And um, I don't know if we'll have time for Aaron's, but uh, Aaron. We'll show it during a break. Actually. Yeah, during a break we'll we'll show Aaron's. Um, but basically, this was this was just his his way of communicating that uh, he could he could do a math lesson. Uh, in in the beginning or an intro introductory yet lesson to the unit and and make it fun so we're we're hoping and that that was probably one of the most successful teacher resources that we found it's getting a lot of hits on uh, YouTube thank you guys yeah <laughs> so secondary tech the grade six to twelve uh, they're a one to one MacBook program they buy them themselves so they have complete ownership and they uh, have admin rights uh, we use manage back as the course management system. And we seem to be really happy with that. We might be looking at it uh, right through for the whole school. Um, and then, oh, this this was the, the other video. Uh, 
right now for this video you can watch it if you want to step up and uh, you know get something to drink say hi to your neighbors uh, we're gonna take a short break before we start the next pre uh, presentation but just watch this video in the background we'll uh, have maybe five minutes or as long as this video is uh, for a little break Back in the day, the date 1789 in France For the peasants, it wasn't a great time They were starving in the streets No bread and cake to eat And the taxes were taking their money every single week The first estate with the clergy And the second, the nobility They were exploiting the third estate to the best of their ability They were peasants, 97% of the population They were taxed to fix the rest of the French nation Normally the peasants were extremely poor But it got much worse after the Seven Years War King Louis the Sixties was stuck in a lot of debt for the military equipment that he had to get. But he didn't want to spend any of the precious gas he wanted to look like a god while the peasants looked like grass. So we raised the tax on bread and wine, thinking it was a solution. But the peasants put its stats, but that's the dawn of a revolution. Roche is in the picture, said he was incorruptible, and his rise to prominence was uninterruptible. He was God to the majority, peasants were his priority, but with power he began to abuse his authority. Inspired by the ideology of the enlightened. And men believe the rights of man were the certain states of life and men started gaining support from the weak and poor pedestrians to get rid of the king, the mess and Machiavellian spread his word around to the peasants who was telling them to stand up for the right and so they began rebelling and they were locked out of an estate general meeting went to the tennis court and walked back to them as people thought a way they could get to be treated differently to get into the highway that they've been with for centuries they made an oath and signed it to make the national assembly they didn't only make an oath of people were making History. Life in the French wage is coming fast and it can't slow down. But now it's really time to make the king pay. We've all come so far and we can't stop now. We're not really sure where we're headed. It's too soon to decide. We'll fight till you drop and stop till you die. We're living life in the French day for the revolution. Life in the French way for the revolution. The riot started happening, beginning of the coup d'etat. A constitution or no king, but the assemblies go from the start. They tore down the Bastille as a result. Of my mentality, leaders as on a stick as a result of my brutality. Brick by brick, taken by the hands of the rebels, destroyed the prison buildings to show they were hard like metal. The peasants were rising in power, they were taking a stand. So in August 26, they wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man, inspired by John Locke's way of inalienable rights. Using the power of the Enlightenment to overthrow the power of oppression. The third estate was angry, they being a press or a time time to the women that have found the box of power is the first time. From the king's castles, rebels armed to the chief, gonna get free Mary and twenty. And Louis the Sixteenth not trying to kill him for that action was impractical. They were captured in the National Guards, took them to the capital. But afterward, they escaped to Baroness in disguise. Dressed as servants, but he was found out despite his lies. Dragged back to Paris, back to his palace home. Even after what he'd done, he then returned to the throne. Then, at the Chef de Mars, anti royal demonstration, there were people, yet the gods killed 50 of the congregation. The king did what he had to do for the rest of the substitution. He finally gave up the threat, and then he formed a constitution. People were still. Everyone needed to do more of your own departure And there were friends that went to war at the war Gave the people of the faith And they came peasants from the palace in 92 Then a represent after he was gone The first time the prophet was here But though we had to go on fire up against Rob's beer Listen, I would like to say That Louis must die from France Music on his way, execution was King Louis' fate He was taken to the public, an apology was way too late The king surveyed the disaster that he had made but never seen A few seconds remorse and then he lost his head to the guillotine As the tyrant king fell, Rosie rose to make help But thousands would then lose their lives without even a farewell Afraid of terror was an error, people thought that right He sent a scared the neighbors for traitors Accused would lose their lives forever Fucked up with power, he threw out Christianity Replaced with a supreme being, many thought was insanity Death was gripping a nation, no day without an execution Horror stricken people, oh, you were put the next solution Most you had to be stopped in, but you was contaminated He was pushed out of power, then he was examined He had a tool, a car without petroleum So with them, he fell into the control of every control again This is all I have to say, I'm such a so in conclusion This is my timeline of the mother French revolution Life in the French wage is coming fast and it can't slow down But now it's really time to make the king pay We all come so far and we can't stop now We're not really sure where we're headed It's too soon to decide Fly till you drop and stop till you die Life in the French day For the revolution Life in the French way For the revolution <laughs>
Grayson Davis come on, comes back over, we'll start our next session. And uh, this one we hope is going to be a heated debate. Heated. show of hands would consider themselves extroverts. Extroverts. That they like talking, that they, one, two, three, four, okay. Your people that, five, six, your people that have your hands up, uh, try not to talk as much during this. <laughs> what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, have a back channel. So you can, you can still talk, but uh, we'd like to have a lot of typing going on. And Bryson's going to read what's going on up here at the same time that the presentation's going on. And he's going to uh, articulate any of the interesting points or arguments that you have with this presentation. So this presentation is about the ultimate classroom. There's no debate. Or school. <laughs> So, and Tom, real quick, yep. so if you guys go to todaysmeet.com... Bryce and I explain all this is. Oh, okay, yep. never mind. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. The, per the purpose <laughs> of, of this presentation is to generate debate. It's also to hear from everyone, as we said, uh, using this back channels. And uh, so, as Bryson was just explaining, you need to go to todaysmeet.com forward slash L10. And that's not cap sensitive, I just put L10 is, is all cap, but it doesn't matter. When you get there, you'll see something that looks like this. You'll put in your name. You could use a capital letter at the beginning of your name if you want. I always encourage my students to. And then you'll press join. When you get in, you'll want to limit your typing to 140 characters. It's just like Twitter, only it's just us. So everything needs to be concise. And then you'll probably want to, well, then you'll probably want to answer the question which is asking, what do you think every classroom needs? So you can say hello, but I'm gonna recommend that you also answer the question, what does every classroom need? Because that's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but please argue with me. Great life. Ooh, like that. Mm -hmm. Interested people, teachers. Okay. I think learners. Going on, safe and 
Would anyone like some help about getting into uh, today's meet? I can come around and just help you to get in. Is it mobile ready? Yep. Yep. Should work on your iPhones and iPads. Not sure what we should be organizing around. Uh, every class we need is just. Eight students. Not sure that we should be organizing around the class we need. Perhaps every learner needs. Ah, okay. John is going to be making <laughs> a lot of help, yeah. Okay, so you can follow what's going on on your computers, but I'm going to tell you right now that iPads we don't need. Let's get rid of them. The reason is Slate.com says an iPad's life cycle cost in the equivalent of virgin paper is a whopping 7,700 sheets over its expected three-year lifetime. So if you're an environmentalist, you don't want to have the iPad. Let's bring in books, a lot more, a lot more paper again. However, whoop, don't miss that. However, Slate.com continues to say, but obviously iPads and other electronic devices can replace much more than just the spiral notebooks. So we might still use the iPads. There are probably other things other than just the environmental uh, concerns. <clears throat> With that said, this is what the ultimate classroom should look like. Uh, there could be students in there. Of course, there might be a few tweaks. But this is the ultimate classroom. What's the first thing that you're noticing that needs to be changed. Let's see it up there. Seating plan. <laughs> no walls at all. Tech for collaboration. Let's make it look like design studio. Variety of different spaces. Oh, seating plans, blackboards, Black notebooks. No books. Okay. Nobody's hit what I'm noticing yet. Mm -hmm. Windows needs posters. Oh, I like the windows. Road, <laughs> road seating as opposed to collaborative seating. Yeah, okay. Interesting. First thing that I'm noticing, because I've gone around to a lot of uh, different schools now, uh, throughout Europe, throughout Asia, first thing I'm noticing is that it needs carpeting. Uh, we want to think about uh, the acoustics that's going on in a classroom. I have Personally, I have bad hearing. I can't really hear that much. And as a teacher, I'm always saying, quiet, quiet, shh, because I can't hear uh, Jimmy over here who's trying to say something. And I wonder how hard it is for other kids when they need that silence to actually uh, be creative and imaginative and actually do something rather than just listen to uh, Bryson talk too much. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think that we also need to think about color. If you look at this picture, this one, some vibrant colors are going on. If anybody knows these pictures, who knows where these pictures are all coming from? Google offices. These are all Google. Google seems to be uh, promoting a lot of uh, creativity. How much are we doing that in our schools, in our classrooms? Are we walking in and seeing a lot of blank walls? White walls? Why aren't we? Sorry? Some people can't operate when it's too many. When it's too vibrant, yeah. right? I, like for me, that's too much. Mm. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why we probably need a lot of different spaces. As uh, somebody said earlier, you, for the people that want the red room, cool, you can go into that red room. For the people that need that blank wall, okay. Maybe what we want to consider is putting in full spectrum light bulbs. Uh, and a full spectrum light bulb is a light bulb that emulates the outdoors. So if you don't have the windows in your classroom, maybe you want to put that in. The one in the bottom right hand corner costs about $8. The one in the top left hand corner costs about $70 or $80. So there are different variations of this. Now, on the websites for these, they say that they uh, are for visual acuity and comfort, they improve readability, they uh, reduce eye strain, they create uh, a relaxing environment. When I read more, about these though, uh, I did find conflicting things that said uh, from the uh, Lighting Research Center and the Canadian government that there's no benefit at all, but I would argue that there must be because if I walk into 
uh, McDonald's, it has certain lighting. If I walk into a low-lit uh, restaurant, it has different lighting. I feel different. So a classroom lighting, it must make a difference. I, I, I would argue that there needs to be more research. Maybe you can articulate that here. The, this is the difference between an incandescent and the full spectrum bulbs. So, with all that said then, this is now what the ultimate classroom should look like. We've got the color, we've got the floor, you've got the carpeting, you've got the groups as you said. Yeah, group, group tables, collaborative group. tables. Group tables, collaborative tables, and I'm going to argue that's why we don't want this. What are we saying? What are we saying here? Huh? Someone was saying they've got a garden classroom, Ooh. which is uh, or in the process of doing a garden classroom. Who is, who is that? That was John. Oh, it was just, no, it was yeah. No, you were you were saying that. Andrew. Uh, yeah, Andrew. At, 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 in Sophia. And okay. Nice. So, a garden classroom sounds beautiful. The reason I'm going to argue against this classroom, though. Uh, is I'm going to base what I'm saying on what Susan Cain says. I don't know if anybody has ever read the book Quiet, but she talks about introverts and extroverts, and she talks about how group work is great for people who are extroverts. But if you're an introvert, and if you actually want to get some work done, it's not going to help you. And she quotes this quote, and see if you recognize where this is from. I am a horse for a single harness, not cut out for tandem or teamwork. Full well do I know that in order to attain any definite goal, it is imperative that one person should do the thinking and commanding. Who knows who that's from? Animal Farm is one guess. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. War horse? Albert Einstein said that. Huh. And he was a classic introvert. Interesting. You read it again, you go, hmm. Okay. And, if you, and if you guys were part of the question and answer session uh, for our, our secondary students, one thing I may argue is that uh, with Google Docs integration, some students were saying that when they're, when they're collaborating with their classmates, Google Docs kind of evens the playing field mm. for the introverts. So even if we were in, in that kind of vibrant classroom, and we're doing collaborative work, maybe with a Google Doc, same with planning for teachers. You can see, or I can see when, when I'm in those sessions, that the teachers that may not speak up all the time, or the students that may not speak up, uh, will, will start writing into those uh, areas where maybe they wouldn't have, have actually spoken up. So that's, that's one argument. That's actually the argument that's from the book. Uh, Susan Cain actually says that, that online collaboration is fantastic for introverts and extroverts because everyone is involved, just like what you said. Mm, so you must have read that book. <laughs> so then this brings us, well, maybe what we need is more of this, these quiet spaces. They've got your own seclusion. You've got your own carpeting. Maybe we want to take it a step further. Maybe we want to be like in Japan. We have really quiet spaces that we can relax in. We have our solitude. Okay, maybe. Maybe this stuff should look like what's in here. So maybe over in there, that's where you can go into a room that has those quiet spaces. But still out here, you have the extrovert ideal. And we're, right. we're doing a little bit of this in the secondary um, uh, with our SDLT rooms, student-directed learning. Uh, and, and basically, those rooms, we've got a, one room for group collaborative work and one room for kind of not introvert work, but one one more yeah, introvert for uh, for basically the spaces where kids can kind of get really silent, concentrate on their work, uh, but but nothing. We haven't gone into this point where we're we're actually painting the walls differently, but that's kind of the goal. So maybe classrooms should look like this, where you've got furniture that can move around. You can move it into group work. You can move it separately. You can get into those nooks and crannies and be quiet. Yeah. I, I think, uh, David, doesn't your school have these really mm -hmm. useful uh, chairs and stuff at your school? Where you can move them into the groups or have it individually. So you want ergonomic, movable 
flexible furniture. Uh, Miss Bond, Amanda here, is uh, asking us that we, when we eventually start to redo this library, uh, what's your one thing that you really like? Oh, it shelves on wheels, please. <laughs> <laughs> the space is, is a great space, but it took a lot to get it to what it looks like today. If we could just move it, it would be a lot more useful, right? <clears throat> okay. Ah, somebody said internet speed. I don't think there's any debate about this. Uh, we want the fastest internet speed you can have. I know Jeff Utech, he usually asks when he goes around, uh, how fast is your internet? Make it faster. Okay. <clears throat> how many of your schools have LCD projectors? Almost. Yeah? Okay. Let's get rid of those. The cost for the LCD projector is about $1,700 to $3,500, especially for the short throw projectors, the ones where you don't cast a shadow. <laughs> the replacement cost for the bulbs is sometimes upwards of one third of the price of the original projector. So if we move over to touchscreen TVs, they're coming in at about the same price, maybe a little bit higher, but the LCD projector light bulbs have a life of about three years. These TVs, probably about eight years. Right. Uh, it would be nice if you have one, two, three, four, five, eight TVs in your, uh, in your classroom, but I think more realistically, uh, you might just have two TVs, have your front channel and your back channel, so that uh, the kids, the introverts, are always having a dialogue. You can have Socrative going on, you can have Today's Meet like you've got, you can have uh, Yjector or Twitter. Uh, there's some sort of back channel for those quiet kids, Google Docs. Speaking of back channel, there is one question, how many kids are introverts? And I don't know, in, in terms of percentages, would anybody like to probably, guess? Probably 20 to 30 percent, as per uh, Susan Cain. Yep. Says, and culture? Uh, right. If we look at uh, Asian culture versus uh, Western culture, it's uh, quite different. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. <clears throat> um, on the walls, of course, you have your TVs, but let's paint the walls with paint that actually is writable on top of it, because you can use every nook and cranny, every corner, and let's let's use it. If it's just there and it's just blank wall, why not make it writable paint? And then, I'm not sure how many people went to the Robert College Ewan McGregor presentation, but he talks about Googleable and not Googleable. Um, I love that idea. So if a question is Googleable, then a kid puts that on a sticky note up on your wall and make sure that they find that answer out and they come back and answer that for the uh, class later on. The not Googleable, those are the questions that are deeper. We're going to answer those in class. But I'm going to take this one step further. I'm going to say, let's make it Wolfram Alphaable and not Wolfram Alphaable as well, because what this is, this is a computational knowledge engine, and this will take all the Googleable questions and actually starts to use like uh, artificial intelligence and answers things that, uh, in a mathematical sense, uh, that uh, you wouldn't really normally be able to do. Now, Wolfram Alpha, you do have to sign up for after a little while, but it's pretty cool and pretty robust. Um, so take it a little bit further. Visualizers, I hope that most classrooms we have a couple here at the school have them. They're great for on the fly. If you can just uh, press a button and do your show and tell. A visualizer is like a, what is it, the overhead projector, uh, but it is it can uh, just take paper and it can take 3D objects and you can just throw it in and show it right away. Don't think there's a lot of debate about that. Anything going on over there, Bryson? Um, what if you're an under-resourced school? So what does the ideal classroom look like for a national or public school that doesn't have the full uh, broadband or, I would guess, funding? Uh, by the end of this presentation, you're going to go, Tom, no school I think could have everything. That, this is all ideal. This, this, I don't know any school that might have all these things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep adding more money to this budget. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it would look like. Um, if you have the Apple TV, since we are going to bring the Apple TVs back, Slates.com uh, said it was okay, then make sure you have those, uh, sorry, if you have the iPads, then make sure you have the Apple TVs, because you want the kids at the back to be able to press in their number and show what they're showing on the screen for everybody to see. Uh, you don't want to have to bring them up and plug it in, it's a lot less likely that's going to happen. So if you went on the primary tour, you, you saw maybe the kids using them, 
and they, they do. Uh, in preschool, so this is ages three and four, use Apple TV and show their puppet pals or whatever they're using. Uh, get those in the classrooms if you don't have them already. We also need these. Anybody recognize this? Yeah. Betamax. Yeah. Well, we don't necessarily need, need Betamax, but we need to be recording. Okay? So you have Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, Harvard, UCLA, they're all recording the sessions that are going on in all the classes so that students and even the teachers and faculty and admin can watch it later. We should be doing this all the time ourselves. In order to do that, we need to have some fisheye cameras in the classrooms. Not for security and stuff, maybe it's security too, but it's for the class. So you can watch what's going on. You need the omnidirectional microphones. It's picking up everything, so the conversations that were going on, you can go, oh, okay, uh, Jimmy said that, great, uh, da, da, da. who is this Jimmy guy? <laughs> and it all needs to be at a push of a button. It shouldn't be something where you have to come in and, okay, you have to plug this in and call tech department and everything else. It should just be something like this. I just found this out <laughs> while I was researching in my presentation. You can actually bring your computers and plug these devices in, and they're already set up so that everything should be set up from the programmers and, and the stuff where it's going to be all saved later on and it just attaches with the push of a button kind of technology. Why not take it a little bit further? That's there for all your devices. So you're bringing in your iPads, your, your uh, iPhones, any, any devices and plugging it all in. It's all push of a button. The systems are set up, uh, everything's going to be recorded and then everybody can watch it later. So as one of our comments are, uh, real-time recording is interesting, but it takes time to review. And that's, that's, a, that's a good debate. I mean, really, if you, if you, have you ever, has, raise, of, raise of hands, anybody ever watched themselves teach off of recording? Okay, that's probably about 50%. That's impressive stats, actually. Uh, normally, when, when we do that uh, in our PDs, Almost nobody's ever done it. Uh, the only time I ever did it really was for my master's program. I haven't done it since. Um, but I think, I think it is worthwhile to, to review to see what you do in your presentations. You know, if you say like a, a ton or if you stumble or if you're nervous, you kind of get better at presenting to the students as well. And I would argue you're going to review not everything, but you're going to review the things that you need to review. Those students preparing for that one part of the test that they didn't understand. Oh, I can watch Mr. Abizade's lecture that was on uh, last Monday because I really didn't understand what was going on right. in history and, at that moment. And again, in the question answer sessions, uh, one student mentioned that his teacher uses the, the um, online board to, to save all the notes, and he's not a really big note taker, so it really helps him because when, he, when the teacher posts his notes on ManageBack later that day, he can review the notes if he needs to. Um, before, yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm not sure how many times you've seen your kids run up after you've written stuff and just take a picture of their phone. <laughs> I've seen that happening these days. And at first, I was like, should I let them? Of course, I should let them do that. That's genius use of technology. Then they can review that later on. Uh, so let's get rid of remotes. Uh, I just was at the International School of Amsterdam. They've got built-in remotes, and they're custom built. So this has an on-off switch. You can change the aspect ratio depending upon whether it's an LCD, uh, whether sorry, whether it's an iPad or whether it's a computer. You can uh, blank screen it and you can freeze. Very simple. Everybody can use it. Again, it's one push of a button. And then that said Mac or iPad if yeah. you can't see that. So it's switched between the two. And then, so beyond the physical parts of the classroom. Oh. Let's also develop some things where, uh, if you can see here, uh, the kids have their two to one, so they have their Macs and they have their devices, and on one of the devices, this is ongoing, it's open all the time, where they can strongly disagree or strongly agree with what's going on, and maybe it's going on in the back channel, or they can say that they understand or that they don't understand, and this is going on in the back channel, and maybe it's showing a graph to the teachers or to the students how many people are getting it or disagreeing with the conversation on the fly. Or if the teacher is carrying around their iPad, right, and they have these uh, 
really handy nutcase iPads. They're walking around and they're seeing uh, the class chart. But as these kids are doing these sliders, maybe the slider is telling them, oh, look, Mark understands it completely, but Amelia, she doesn't get what's going on. So I'm going to walk over to Amelia right now because she's sliding the conversation and saying, ah, this is good, this is bad. This technology, I couldn't find that it existed. I, I made it up right now. <laughs> maybe it exists. Maybe you can tell me what that, oh, yeah, that exists. That's this app. <laughs> Tom, get it for you. Right. And, and even on the back channel where they're saying uh, classroom with mobile device friendly, that would be something where maybe the students would be, you know, using their, their phones or their smartphones, uh, device independent as well as what you're saying on the back channel. Um, so they would, they would have a slider and just kind of say, ah, I get that. So again, that's, that's something for the introverts to say, uh, I actually didn't really understand that, but I'm too quiet or too, too shy to say that. Somebody's, right. somebody's saying it does exist. It does. Okay, it does. And, and what is it called? I don't remember. But oh. it's I figured it must exist. Anytime you okay. think about something, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll get my okay. coding and apps uh, class to make it. And it, it <laughs> seems simple. That's and really then, simple. It must exist. Another thing on the back channel was, um, was, are there privacy issues with having recordings of students? And doesn't it get uncomfortable when you've got a fisheye lens that you know is constantly recording? I would argue that if you know that it's, that it's recording, if you thought about it in a different light, if you thought about it for security purposes, it doesn't make you as uncomfortable. If you thought about it as, as you know, this is constantly an administrator looking at my, my teaching skills, yeah, that would be a little bit uncomfortable. But I think you, you would really eventually get used to it and, and value it once you actually reviewed your videotapes and, and started improving on your, on your teaching and presentation. Don't, um, don't we have, we have a couple teachers who are recording their sessions all the time using Google, uh, Google on Hangouts. Or Google Hangouts. Yeah, and I, I think, because I've watched some of the earlier sessions, and you can see the kids are, <laughs> but because they've done it enough, eventually you start to forget that it's going on. Yeah, you know, does the back channel model imply a teacher-centered classroom? Does it? Wait. Do you mean oh. Does the right. back channel model imply a teacher-centered classroom? It, no. No. It would be the opposite. Especially, of especially if we can not be up here doing it the way that we're doing it, and we have the kids that are leading the session and choosing which sessions they want to lead, but they know that the back channel is going to go on to support their audience. Uh, it doesn't necessarily imply that at all. Uh, and in fact, this is this is odd that I stand at the front and talk. In most of the classes that I ever walk in, I like to uh, get to the back, have student drivers, and they usually, I'm like, D don't look at me for help. You ask your audience if you need some help, and the kids will take ownership of things. But are they taking ownership all the way to designing their own curriculum? Not yet. Maybe, maybe soon. <clears throat> um, so another thing that does exist right now is uh, Casper Studio and Jamf. If you're using the uh, iPads and you do want to have some sort of uh, way that you can send out information or help kids, then this this uh, exists. So if you again, if you're the teacher carrying these around, you can see. Okay, Bryson needs some help because he was red, and maybe I can help him with this uh, by standing over here because it's a quick question. And or or the opposite. If you've got your high flyers saying they completely get it and you kind of walk over and double check on their computers or their iPads that they do understand it, then you can easily just go, okay, you know, hey, Filippo, can you, can you throw your stuff up online uh, or up on the, on the Apple TV so that everybody can see what you're doing? So it's a good exemplar for the high flyers as well. Right, so voice critical thinking on, on back channels, so it makes it, it improves student writing and improves their, uh, their ability to kind of cut it down to 140 characters and think really what's important to say here. <clears throat> so, of course, we're taking all of this, all these physical things, and uh, we're, there's a lot of companies out there that are manifesting this into the adaptive technology. Uh, so you've got Newton and Khan Academy and Alex and, and so many more. But you're still the educator. You're still the coach. You want to help the students with their personalized learning. You want the space and the tech are just part of this equation. But 
teaching the pedagogy and all that other stuff, that's a total other ballpark. That's not what we've touched at, at all. This was just about the physicalities of your classroom. There's so much that this is taking us to. Again, this is all ideal, I think. Maybe it's not ideal. John, I know you have other ideas too, right? Right. Too limiting, let the students free. So uh, was that in reference to the... the Casper. Casper, yeah. It, it, it's too limiting? So in terms of, of say, having the control. They don't want control. They right. Hate them. Yeah, they do hate the control. That was the first, actually the biggest... Uh, when, when we said, hey, you know, we're going to give you guys, or we're not going to give you guys MacBooks, but we're going to take in your personal MacBooks, reconfigure it, make sure your stuff's backed up, and we, we will have admin access just in case you need to update some software or anything like that that the school owns on your, on your MacBooks. No way. The kids are like, this is my MacBook. We don't really want you involved in this. Uh, how do you have admin access? Can you read my emails? Can you do all this stuff? That's their, their, their control is, is all of a sudden they're hugely into privacy. So it's one of those, even though you can read their Facebook posts, you know, because they, they haven't figured out that. Um, but all those things are, are hugely important to them. So the control aspect is, is hard to, to kind of come to, to terms with. Uh, I'm reading, Dylan Williams might suggest throw some specific questions to the back channel. Don't always trust when they say, I get it, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, with adults, we're uh, letting this back channel happen uh, on its own, but with students, especially the younger, younger ages, we would uh, probably uh, ask much more pointed questions. I, I think that's a great idea. That's uh, Mr. Marshall? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. And we've also had the, the experience where the back channel may be too distracting, where if you open up a Google Doc, for example, and Effort. you know, you've got that one kid who just keeps on deleting everybody's stuff or writing expletives. Um, so but revision. That, that goes away eventually, yeah. hopefully. Back channel reporting that is public to the full class like this can make this so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amanda? Um, so this was the end of this presentation. Now, a back channel for us <clears throat> is what I want to point out just for a moment here, is the L10, uh, we've now got the Google Groups, and we can be continually talking, uh, maybe we can show it here. Yeah. Because this conversation, uh, in today's meet, it's really neat, you can download this whole conversation because uh, when you choose to set up a class, uh, it can be for an hour, it can be for a day, it can be for a week, but at the bottom of that, uh, so we can now download this and then have this whole chat to read over later. And I'm going to put this in, uh, in here. So we've now got Google Groups, if you want to scroll down a little bit, Bryson. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm going in here. Yep. And I'm not sure how many people have joined other Google Groups, but when you join this uh, and you sign up, you'll now receive any questions and any answers in your email uh, through Google. It's uh, nice, I have joined the ISTEC Google Group and the ESIS Google Group, and I see some really great conversations going on. So I do recommend, if you haven't joined this Google Group, that we can have our own L10 back channel that's just constantly going, that we're hearing from one another, uh, asking and answering questions. Um, while we're there, Bryson, if you mm -hmm. can just uh, show also, uh, we're in, built into the website. If you haven't been here before, we've got the ongoing tweets are always uh, going through. So if you ever hashtag L10, then it will be showing up on the, the website. So it's another back channel that we have flowing through here. <clears throat> Does anybody? want to actually speak and say some things about what they really agree with or what they really don't agree with about this uh, presentation so far? Typing was enough. Yes? Well, I totally like the idea of the new classroom because I think that today uh, the classrooms aren't enough for because because, you know, um, they want to collaborate, talk to each other, create things and show those to their uh, 
classmates and they definitely need more space for that to create something. For example, they want to take a video mm -hmm. or they want to shoot pictures and uh, they want to talk to their friends and work with them. And uh, in our current classroom design, that's nearly impossible mm -hmm. because the rooms are colorless, there isn't enough lighting and all this stuff. And if you want to get out, it's a burden. If you want to talk to somebody, it's difficult. So. Mm -hmm. uh, well, while you're talking about that and saying that, if you want to uh, show this presentation and anything from this meeting, if you go to the previous meetings here, mm -hmm. uh, you can see all the resources. And this will be, after today, this will be a previous meeting. And I, I'm going to make sure that all the videos, every session today is being recorded. Uh, many of the sessions in here, or all the sessions in here from now on, will be on Google uh, Hangouts, which means it'll be on YouTube. They'll all be linked in here on the website, so if you ever want to go back, you can find some uh, information, some resources. So if you want to show this presentation to admin and whatnot, uh, that will be there. You can go, look, Tom said. <laughs> it's really provocative. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say on that note, too, I think that um, with, no matter what someone's funding level is, I mean, someone made the comment about being a national school or a public school, that there are, I think, small differences that people can do, even if you just have a smartphone or mm. you, you know, do some kind of fundraiser to change the color in the classroom. Yeah, you know. I, I mean, it probably doesn't take the school any money if they want to just say, okay, it's a bring your own device. If they can't afford some of the things that we were showing, for sure. Uh, just then takes okay some infrastructure for well can we support that with our internet fast internet number one <laughs> right yeah that's that's what we've um, we've had issues where uh, we actually didn't allow um, students or teachers mobile access because it was bogging down our internet access so now we're getting to the stage where we can we can improve that and and allow access maybe next year but it's it's a struggle if you don't have well we're we're out in the boonies. But uh, if you don't have uh, fiber optic net and and the backup when it breaks, the funding or anything yeah. to to increase your your bandwidth. Um. So with that said, coming up up here, we're going to have Kim Fi Kim Cafino and Linda. Linda, where are you? Yeah, Linda's going to be hosting Kim on a Google Hangout in here. Uh, Kim was at our first L10 two years ago. And she's uh, Skyped in with us. Today it's going to be a Google Hangout because we want to record the session. We have Claire. Claire, are you in here? Nope. Claire's not in here. She's going to be down the hall to the left uh, in room 223. And she's talking about the Google. That was the major change. Uh, there's Claire. That was the major change. So if you had uh, chosen to sign up for Claire's, and if you forget, again, uh, you can look at these uh, little signs around the, the walls. Um, so she's going to be down the hall, and then downstairs, we're going to have Aleph, are you here? Hi, yep, yep. And uh, she's going to be downstairs in the boardroom, and it's a nice boardroom that's got uh, some windows and stuff, and you'll be talking about iPads and, yeah? Using the iPads. Using the iPads. Now, down there, there's only, so I think the people that have signed up uh, are, are basically the only people that are able to go, because there's only 12 spots down there. It's a smaller room. So it'll be a little bit more intimate. That's why there was a, a change, because uh, the other group is a bit and, and I can lead you guys down there, just you know, yeah, yeah. Because Ella might not know as well. Um, so if you want to have a break, stretch your legs. We're going to start these uh, next presentations at uh, eleven o'clock. Eleven o'clock. Yeah. Thank you.
Ado. Thank you. 
Just to, just to yeah. the end. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, Turkey in the past while has become more difficult with Google
Okay, I'll tell you. Oh my God, that's so much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked. Just, you don't just, have to know who I am. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I, I, I asked because um, I, I, I didn't want to spend time introducing you too much if, if everybody was aware of, of, of who Kim is. And I asked that because I have followed Kim's work for, for many, many, many years. Um, she is, she, if you can find her, to follow her, uh, she blogs prolifically about um, all things tech, tech and education related. She's an Apple Distinguished Educator. She believes in inquiry and construct, constructivist-based um, learning and um, global and collaborative learning environments. So she's here to join, to, to help us today understand a pilot program they're about to undertake with two devices to one student. And I think at that, Kim, I'll probably turn it over to you. Thank you for the glowing introduction, and um, I really appreciate all those kind words. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm going to um, cut I guess you I off. Sorry, Kim. Sorry. sorry, really sorry, Kim. We have opened up for people if they want to. We're going we're gonna to try to be um, uh, risk-takers uh, risk, risk here. And if you go to uh, Google Hangouts on Air, our Hangout right now is there, and you can join that. There's a Q&A back channel running if you want to. We'll try to both, Amanda and I will try to watch the questions as they come up if you're not um, sure you want to raise your hand up. We really do want people to be interactive. So if you prefer to use the back channel, go ahead and use the back channel on the Hangouts on Air Q&A. It looks like that, okay? And um, you can find it just by going to your Google Plus profile and Hangouts on Air. And if, you, if not, stick your hand in the air and we will um, we will get your question to Kim, okay? And I'll be quiet now, Kim. No worries. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, here at YS. So right now I'm working at Yokohama International School in Japan. And we are a small school. We're about um, 650 students in our school. And um, I would say we're really open-minded and innovative and a risk-taking community um, where I would say teachers and parents are really supportive of what best practice in education could look like in the future, even if we haven't experienced it before ourselves. So that's a really exciting place for me personally to be working. Um, and so we've been one-to-one -one for the last three years. I came to YS four years ago, and that was one of the first um, big projects we had after I arrived was going into a one-to-one -one environment. So our one-to-one -one program is called our Connected Learning Community, and we've got all students from grade four to grade 12 have their own device. Um, grade four and five, they stay at school, and six to 12, they take their device home. Uh, different grade levels have different devices. Right now, we're transitioning into MacBook Air 11 inches. So all new devices issued will be MacBook Air 11 inch. And the reason why that is, is because we're moving towards a two to one program, meaning that each student will have two devices. And there are lots of kind of reasons behind that, and I'll try to give a little summary now, um, and then we can do questions after that. Um, but what we're starting with is we're starting with a trial of grade seven. So all grade seven students starting next week will have two devices, a Mac Air 11 inch and a Mac, uh, iPad mini. So they'll have those two devices for the month of May and then we'll kind of reflect on how that process went and if it went the way we wanted it to and students are using the devices the way we want them to, then we'll continue that next year and next year's grade seven, we'll have the two devices for the whole year and then we'll see how that scales up um, after next year. And for the last, I guess it's been about three months, all the grade seven teachers have had an iPad mini. We've been doing lots of training with the teachers and we've been doing uh, community focus groups with um, teachers, parents, and students together and training with teachers and parents separately. And then now we're kind of bringing it all together with the actual trial starting the next Thursday. That's kind of a summary there. Um, do we have any questions at this moment? I have a question. What were some of the challenges you encountered? I think the biggest challenge for us right now, first of all, we haven't started the initiative with students, so I don't know what's going to happen next week, yeah. so that will be very exciting. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that we really don't know what this looks like. There aren't a lot of schools in the world that are doing this. There's very, very few schools that have 
school issued multiple device programs. In fact, the only one that we could find is the Avenue School in New York. That's where like Surrey Cruz goes. Um, so we finding that kind of um, best practice to model our work on, it was really difficult. So what we had to do was combine what people do well with iPads and then what we know works well with laptops and kind of build that together because there's no models for this yet or very few, I should say. Yeah, I have a question. You said you mm -hmm. want to see how the, student, the students use the devices the way you want. How do you want them to use the devices? Could you hear that, Kim? No, sorry. Okay, the question is, you, you said um, that we want to see how, if the students use the devices, how you want them to use them in the, in the pilot that yep. you're going to. How is it that you want them to use them? Yep. So on one of the things that we've done is we've had a community focus group session with students, parents, and teachers together. And we broke that session down into two parts. Um, the first session being what would success look like, and then how can we get there? And I think that success piece, what, what would success look like, is the really important part. And so what we're hoping to see is students using the two devices as complementary mm -hmm. tools. For example, the iPad is really great for natural input handwriting, whereas that's quite difficult on a laptop. So we'd like to see them being able to use the devices for the purposes that they work really well for. The iPad is really great for taking media, so video and audio and images. And so we want to see them doing that instead of walking around, you know, how they do, holding their laptop, turn around, taking video and walking up the stairs with their laptop open. It's not really meant to do that. So using um, the devices in the best possible way. Of course, another thing we'd like to see continue develop is our students' ability to make good choices. So thinking about balance, thinking about responsible digital citizenship, thinking about how they share and what they share and when they share. So taking that, which we've worked really hard to build with our connected learning community using laptops, taking all those skills and then applying them in a mobile setting. And I don't know what your schools are like, but our students, I would say, well, I know 100% of the uh, six through 12 students have some access to a mobile phone. They're not all smartphones. I would say probably 80 to 90% have access to an iOS device, whether it's a I, um, iPod or an iPad or an iPhone. So they already have these devices in their lives, but they're not thinking about them the same way they think about their laptop because their laptop is for school and their mobile devices are kind of their own. So we're hoping to make that transition between understanding how to use the device for kind of appropriate academic purposes in a laptop setting, also to a mobile setting. And then of course, another element is the fact that the iPad can go lots of different places. So being able to take their iPad and learn in many different contexts was um, a criteria for success by the students, parents, and teachers. One of the things the students noticed is that when they travel on the train, they get kind of looked at funny when they're using their computer, because it's not really common for Japanese people to have a computer open on the train. But if they have an iPad, that's kind of a normal thing. So they'll feel more comfortable doing work during their commuting time, which is a really nice thing for them because that's a good chunk of time they can actually be a bit productive. I think I kind of addressed some of the big themes there. Yeah. We have a question um, on the Q&A. And we just, we mark it, we mark it as selected so that when you go to watch this video on YouTube, when it's been recorded, you'll see um, this question show up so that you know that it's being answered, okay? Oh. So the question, Kim, is since there are not many people doing this, how will you document what you are doing for the rest of the world to see? Good question. That was one of our um, ways that we pitched this program is that we can do the research and we can um, share what we're learning with everybody. So of course we have already, we have a blog. Um, it's blogs.yas.ac.jp slash iPads. Um, so we've already got a blog where we're starting to document the learning that, that is going on with our, our staff. And we have a team of teachers that really needs to be pulled together better, and I, that's my job to do that, um, to do some action research on the actual impact of having the iPads in the classroom for the next month. So our goal is to actually write some kind of research and to be able to share that with schools who are interested. And I know that, just to give you um, another avenue, I know that WAB, uh, Western Academy of Beijing, has done a lot of work in that area as well. So they've had various iPad trials, um, and that's another good connection that we're, we're working together with WAB on that as well. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. 
uh, what are you doing to change the ideas of the teachers and the parents that are opposing this idea of two to one? Could you hear that, Kim? I heard what are we doing to change the ideas of the teachers and the parents that are opposing the yeah, idea? Yeah. yeah, you should have some at least. <laughs> we have a really supportive and engaged parent community. I think people, I'm trying to think of the right words to um, say. I'm sure, I know that parents have concerns but I think in general, parents just want to be involved in the process and we really try hard to do that. So because we're involving parents and teachers in the process, I think that helps it not feel like this is forced upon them, but that it's a community initiative. Having said that, I know that there are concerns um, and I think what we do about those concerns is we involve as many people as we can. We have as many conversations as we can about the issues that are of concern and I would say the number one issue of concern and has been the same since we um, instituted our one-to-one -one program is balance and kids being able to make good choices about how much time they spend online. So that's something we really focus on strongly at school and it's something we encourage parents to focus on at home. Um, so I would say that's the biggest concern and it's a, it's a lot of it is education, whether it's small group PD for teachers where we run monthly parent tech coffee mornings for the parents, or it's the community focus groups where we involve parents, or it's newsletters home to parents, or it's sharing videos with parents. A lot of it is about education and keeping the lines of communication open. Um, I got my question. Uh, yes, teachers. How, do you, how much time do you spend educating the teachers on incorporating the technology into their curriculum? I didn't hear, sorry. How much time do you spend um, educating the teachers? Um, Incorpor in how to incorporate the technology. How, how to incorporate the technology. Into their in, into, into their, their lessons. So I think that's kind of two parts because we've already had the laptops for three years. So I would say the teachers feel really confident and really comfortable with a laptop in their classroom. Like they have their own laptop and all the kids have a laptop. That's a really comfortable feeling for I think all of our teachers, I mean, maybe a few people are still not entirely sure what to do, but for the most part, everyone feels really confident in that area. So now this is about how are we making them, helping them feel comfortable with an iPad. And what we've done for that is we've had a number of all grade level meetings. So the whole seventh grade staff, which in our school is actually quite large for the size of our school, will come together and will share. Um, and usually we don't teach directly to them. So my a teaching partner, Clint Hamada, who's also a technology and learning coach. We don't teach directly to them. We kind of encourage teachers to teach each other. And we use um, different models for that, small, mostly small group learning. So we've had a couple of meetings where the whole grade seven staff is together. And then we've asked teachers to create a smaller group of people they feel comfortable with, either because they're at the same skill level or they teach the same subject or they're interested in the same goals. And what they've done is they've met regularly every two weeks since we started the program. So when they have their meetings, often Clint or I will be at the meeting with them to support them, um, or we'll just kind of follow up with them informally and see how things went. And then in addition to those regular meetings where people are working in teams and sharing and collaborating together, we've had extended PD sessions with those same groups where, where we've, we've made kind of a nice framework, I'm gonna blog about it, a nice framework for um, a PD session with uh, each small group team where they've had an opportunity to explore what we are calling the big 10 apps so the top 10 apps that we want students to be able to use and to understand how the use of these apps could transform learning in the classroom and of course there's always ongoing PD just at the school because there are two of us that are technology and learning coaches we can always support um, our staff and then we've got regular PD after school we've got regular PD and department meetings those kinds of things that happen just as normal practice. Yeah. Yeah. Follow-up mm -hmm. question. So what I, I didn't really mean their comfort level with having computers in the classroom. I meant other than like for word processing and things like that, yeah. how do you help the teachers to incorporate technology in, for learning objectives? Okay, so in more, more detail on, learn, on how do you help teachers incorporate technology for learning objectives? Not comfort. Not comfort. 
So uh, I think I think if if I'm right, you're you're asking about the actual teaching of the the tools, right. the tools that the teachers right. are expected to use. Right. So whether it's Garage Band or whether it's, I think that's what you're asking yes. about, right? Whether which which applications um, that the teachers would use in the classroom, how do they learn how to to use those applications? Am I right? Is that what you're getting at? Yes, and how are they using these applications? Sorry, was there a clarification there? I can't hear. Oh, okay. when she talks, I can't hear. Sorry. It was. It was more. More. Uh, am I? Am I restating your question properly, or do you want to come right up and ask it? Do you want to come do that? Yeah, that might be. That might be better than me translating. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Yes. Basically, Hi. <laughs> basically, more than just their comfort level in the classroom with computers. How are you teaching the, the teachers how to use different applications or programs? in order to then use that in their classroom, because every teacher doesn't know GarageBand or Photoshop or whatever, and how are they adding this into their curriculum in a more meaningful way than just saying, okay, we're going to use GarageBand to the students. I mean, yeah. We don't really operate by apps or programs. Um, we operate by what do you want students to know and be able to do, and then how can we get there? And so the way we we've kind of structured this PD is we've asked teachers to think about this um, one month time and what unit they're going to be teaching during this time span and what do you want students to know and be able to do during this one month time span. And then we've asked them the traditional ways that they get there, like how would you normally get their pencil and paper, how would you get there on a computer, how would you get there. And then we've looked at all the various apps to see what they could do. And then we said, oh, well, now we can use this app to get at this learning objective, or we can use this app to get at this learning objective. So for me, the it always starts with what do you want students to know and be able to do, and then everything else goes from there. So we don't teach GarageBand or Photoshop ever, really. Mm. We've got another uh, question on the back channel on the Q&A. What are your top 10 apps? I know you don't teach them, but what, what, what are your Good questions? <laughs> um, so we're, one of the things I said uh, about this whole process is that we don't really know exactly how things are going to turn out, right? So one of the things is with these apps, are these going to continue to be our top 10 apps or are they just our top 10 apps right now? And the ones that we have right now, I feel like I should look at the website and make sure I'm correct. Um, Google Drive. We're heavily into Google Apps for Education, so Google Drive is a no-brainer for us. Um, Notability, and uh, Notability is really great for um, annotating PDFs. So any sort of um, text document that you have, you can handwrite over it with Notability, which is super helpful. Photobabble, we think that um, teachers have kids talk about their learning a lot at school, so taking a photo and being able to record their voice over that photo and then share that learning is really powerful for us. Um, Flipboard, looking at being able to create collaborative textbooks using the Flipboard app. Um, and being able to kind of keep those textbooks really up to date. Um, uh, voice Recorder HD, like I said, we do a lot of um, student reflection and recording of voices and creating media. So Voice Recorder HD over GarageBand in that it's really super simple. We have GarageBand available to all the students too, but that's one of the ones in the top 10. I think iMovie's in the top 10. My gosh, I have four more to go. I was just looking at this today. Oh, Coach's Eye. Um, Coach's Eye for um, annotating video. So like kids are at performing a science experiment and annotating that video or doing something in PE class and annotating you know, the swing of their arm as they're pitching the ball. Um, explain everything for tutorial videos or, well, to explain everything, you know, kind of like a whiteboard uh, that kids can record their voices and images and writing. And I've got two more pressures on. If you give me a minute, I can actually open pages, up the website keynote, and tell you for sure. Keynote pages. Is it oh. keynote or pages? No. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. You know, that, like I said, it's just, it's an experiment, right? So maybe that will become really important. Oh, but we oh, do have them installed. We have all the iLife apps installed. Oh, YouTube Capture. How could I forget that? 
YouTube Capture and WordPress. Duh. So YouTube Capture for easily capturing video. And then <laughs> I, I hate that on the fly. But, <laughs> And uh, WordPress, because we have all, every student at our school has a blog, so we want them to be able to um, update their blog as they're, as they're being mobile. Um, I, I have a question for you, Kim. I'm lucky yes. to, I work in a, we're piloting BYOD in our grade six classroom. I also happen to be really lucky enough to house 10 iPads in a deck of 10, 10 iPads in my room. So, and I have an Apple TV. And sometimes what I'm finding that I'm clumsy at is the transition between am I doing something on my computer, am I projecting something from my computer, am I projecting, are we doing something from the iPads, where am I sharing from with the one projector? Um, can you t talk a little bit about how you will how you'll work with teachers on that, what your classroom setup is like for working with the two to one devices? Yeah. So we do not have Apple TV, sadly. Um, our projectors don't allow the HDMI um, cable, so we can't use Apple TV, which is kind of a bummer. But we've invested in AirPlay for all of our uh, teacher computers. So every teacher computer has AirPlay, which is basically does the same thing as Apple TV. It allows you to stream any iOS device through your computer then to the projector. So every teacher has access to that, which means every iPad in the room can be, be thrown up on the projector just like uh, Apple TV. And I think. I am also really learning how to be kind of seamless with that, and I am definitely not there. Um, and Dana Watts, who formerly worked at the American Embassy School in New Delhi, she's amazing. When I see her flick between the two devices, she's worked in a one-to-one -one iPad school for the last year, and she's super seamless. So I know that it will come. Um, the one thing that all of our teachers are talking about is they forget that when their iPad goes to sleep, and they have to type in their password again when it's projected, it's already projected onto the screen, or they're typing in their password once they've opened it up to something else, it'll also show on the projector. So that's something to consider, that your password will show up on the projected screen. And then another thing we've talked about um, is that with AirPlay, anyone can stream through your computer, so you need to have a password on there. So you can either have an on-screen password, or you can have a password that you set. But if you have a password that you set and it's the same all the time, kids in another room might know what your password is and be able to stream from another room to your computer. And they might not do it on purpose. It might be accidental, but that's kind of a pain in the neck. So thinking about how you manage who gets to stream through to your um, your projector is, is important. Is that what you're asking me? Yep. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Um. Are you planning to fully integrate technology into your lessons for next year? For example, uh, when you open up your yearly plan, will you be able to see the technology uh, just integrated into the lesson so that you can say we will be uh, doing the transition for next year? So what are your plans for next year? I think already teachers have uh, technology integrated into their lesson plans. The school's been one-to-one um, -one for a while, so that's kind of a, already an expectation. If you're talking specifically about the use of iPads, I think for our teachers, they'll be prepared for this final unit of, of the year. Um, but if things go ahead next year, they'll need some additional time, just like they've had time this year, to plan units earlier in the year, which I think is totally legitimate. Like, we can't expect them to plan for next year right now if we don't even know what's going forward. Mm -hmm. Which we hope it is, you know, but. Mm -hmm. cool. There's another question on the, the Q&A. Could you expand on how you present the need for balance with the students? Oh yeah. So, this is a huge topic, right? Because we happen to live in a country where the internet is really fast and easily accessible and everybody's got devices and they're constantly on their devices. So. The idea of you know putting it away is a is can be a really challenging one, and then there's also the concept that just because you're off your device doesn't make you balanced, right? Like there are ways that you can relax and enjoy your life when you're on your device too. So this kind of separation of off and on is not legitimate either. So that's kind of a um, a challenge for balance in general, I think, for everyone. Um, but the way that we work with students is we have an orientation at the beginning of the year. Should I still keep talking or something wrong? Yep, nope, good. we're good. Keep talking. Okay. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we have a two-day orientation where we kind of refresh the key themes of our connected learning community, like our vision, 
And one of the things that we come back to every year is that concept of balance. And we do all sorts of different activities to get kids thinking about the way they spend their time online. We also have a digital citizenship week during the school year where we highlight, again, balance is a key theme there. We look at where students are spending their time online, how much time they're spending, is that valuable, is that productive, do they really want to spend that much time online, what happens when they spend that much time online, how rested are they feeling, all those kinds of questions that we all kind of wrestle with as adults. And then we have a digital citizenship curriculum that runs throughout the year and is delivered primarily in the humanities class. And within that curriculum, there's also the topic of balance. And then I like to think that most teachers feel really comfortable talking about this. And if it came up in class, they would be able to have kind of a conversation about it. Um, and I know for me as a teacher and as a tutor, I have a grade six homeroom, we call it tutor at YS. That's a, a topic that comes up quite a bit and you know, kind of making good choices and closing your lid before an hour before you go to sleep and kind of building in some of those strategies. And then for parents, we have those parent tech coffee mornings that I mentioned, and we have a list of resources for parents to help them take the strategies that we have at school and apply them at home. So some simple things we have at school are no laptops at break and no laptops at lunch, which sounds very black and white, but it's a little bit more difficult to enforce if it's not very black and white, so that's kind of an interesting conversation. Um, so we, we encourage parents to also find time times at home when it's a no laptop time. Maybe it's dinner time and everybody puts their devices away, mom and dad included. Um, we talk about strategies for making um, time online productive time. So using breaks and using apps to help you build in those breaks like the Pomodoro technique which lets you um, work for 15 minutes and then have a five minute online break and then work for 15 minutes, essentially kind of a timer. So apps like that we um, strategize with parents and we kind of give them the research that goes behind that and why you would want to do that um, and we talk about things like having a contract um, having a, a bedtime um, turning off the internet at home if that's a challenge because kids have a laptop maybe they may put the laptop away but they also have the phone um, I think that I think I've covered most things one, one other thought that comes to my mind in this is being back in the classroom and watching kids on their devices all the time is the ergonomics, the physical impact of working in a yep. small screen and being bent over um, all the time. Um, is that something that ever comes up in discussions in your community? Because it has come up in ours as it well. Comes up, yeah, it comes up now and again. And I think, I don't think we have a good answer for it, right? Because you're going to then have additional pieces you have to deal with. If you're really going to solve that problem, you need to have your monitor higher, your keyboard lower. Maybe you're going to even have a mouse or some other device. So it involves so many other pieces, and our students are constantly moving from place to place. It just makes that a bit more. I think a lot of the time at school, kids aren't sitting at desks. They're sitting on the floor, or they're hanging out. We you know, have different ways for kids to be seated. I definitely think it's a challenge. I don't think we have an answer to it, though. We only have about one minute. Okay, we have about one minute. And I've got, there's one question at the back. Um, yeah. Do you have any health problems like uh, people opposing because of the wireless radiation or eye degeneration? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did you Sorry, hear? I couldn't hear that. Are there any questions raised in your community about Wi-Fi and radiation and um, issues? Nothing. With the eyes. I mean, this whole country is wired. <laughs> Anyone want to talk about radiation? We're talking about Fukushima. We're not talking about Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I guess we, we need to wrap up. Thank you very, very much, uh, Kim, for um, uh, your time today and your thought to, to all our, our questions on the fly like this. It's been uh, really, really helpful, really, really useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So you can follow Kim at, at, at MS Cofino on. Oh, you've got it up there already. Uh, got it. Well, actually, you I can said explain that's her that, Twitter. At MS Cofino is, yep. is her Twitter uh, handle, and there's her the more information about her. I highly recommend following her. She's amazing. And she runs the Cotel yeah. uh, programs with uh, Jeff Utech.
if you want to. And she shares prolifically. Really, she shares everything that she's working on. She shares their their guidelines, their procedures, their their policy, whatever it is that they're working on. She shares it, which is brilliant. Tom, um, uh, actually, I could say to everybody, she mentioned in top ten one of, one was notability. And if you have Axcom free, it's free today. Ooh. Today? <laughs> I think it's three or four dollars. Um, That's good to know. So we have a, a break right now. And then uh, we'll be having two discussions. One's going to be in here. And another one's going to be at room 223. I should take this off and make it easier. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, so a 20 minute break right now. Okay. Yeah. Oops. I don't want to work you too hard. <laughs> 20 minutes, we should only have three minutes. That's all new. Yes. I was watching the clock thinking, okay, it's 11.25 class, and it's time to start wrapping up. You know? Yeah. Did my question not come up? I, sorry, I was looking. No, 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 no. Did you try? Yeah, I was going to show it. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's really a. I keep going out. I would not be surprised. The Wi Fi keeps going out on this. Yeah, my Oh, mine is. But it's been gone out several times. Yeah. You've had to sign in something just to change. Well, I'm sorry. I've had to sign in twice. But what we noticed when we were done. Actually, you guys have a question. So that's interesting that you were able to post like, on the phone. Oh, I didn't post. Didn't post no, up. Now, were you on Twitter? Good afternoon. Google 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 Google. Google. I'm Neil Miller. I'm presenting today on stage. Are you on the hand? I'm going to be talking about boys or something. I'm not really sure how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it's if be your Apple TV that would be doing the cool So the I'm here to tell you that we have a problem with voice. No, actually the, and it's a serious the problem with voice. Heck, Tyra will tell us that we have a problem with voice. The computer. And the problem is that their culture isn't working in schools. And I'm going to share oh, no. with you ways that we can think about overcoming that problem. First, I want to start by saying, this is a boy. And this is a girl. And this is probably stereotypical what you think of as a girl. If I essentialize gender for you today, then you can dismiss what I have to say. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not interested in doing that. This is a different kind of boy and a different kind of girl. Right? So the point here is that not all boys exist within these rigid boundaries of what we think of as boys and girls, and not all girls exist within those rigid boundaries of what we think of as girls, but in fact, most boys tend to be a certain way and most girls tend to be a certain way. And the point is that for boys, the way that they exist and the culture that they embrace isn't working well in schools now. How do we know that? The 100 Girls Project tells us some really nice statistics. For example, for every 100 girls that are suspended from school, there are 250 boys that are suspended from school. For every 100 girls that are expelled from school, there are 305 boys who are expelled from school. For every 100 girls in special education, there are 217 boys. For every 100 girls with a learning disability, there are 276 boys. For every 100 girls with an emotional disturbance oh, sorry, diagnosed, yeah. we have 324 boys. And by the way, all of these numbers are significantly higher if you happen to be black, if you happen to be poor, this was, it was showing if you happen to exist in an overcrowded school. Right? And if you are a boy, you're four times as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, there is another side to this, and it is important that we recognize that women still need help in school, that salaries are still significantly lower, even when controlled for jobs with job types, and that girls have continued to struggle in math and science for years. That's all true. Nothing about that prevents us from paying attention to the literacy needs of our boys between ages 3 and 13. And so we should. In fact, what we ought to do is take a page from their playbook. Because the initiatives and programs that have been set in place for women in science and engineering and mathematics are fantastic. They've done a lot of good for girls in these situations. And we ought to be thinking about how we can make that happen for boys, too, in their younger years. 
even in their older years, what we find is that there's still a problem. When we look at the universities, 60% of baccalaureate degrees are going to women now, which is a significant shift. And in fact, university administrators are a little uncomfortable about the idea that we may be getting close to 70% female population in universities. This makes university administrators very nervous because girls don't want to go to schools that don't have boys. And so, we're starting to see the establishment of men's centers and men's studies to think about how do we engage men in their experiences in the university. To talk to faculty, they may say, ah, yeah, well, they're playing video games and they're gambling online all night long and they're playing World of Warcraft and that's affecting their academic achievement, okay? Guess what? Video games are not the cause. Video games are a symptom. They were turned off a long time before they got here. Alright? So let's talk about why they got turned off when they were between the ages of 3 and 13. There are three reasons that I believe that boys are out of sync with the culture of school today. The first is zero tolerance, right? Kindergarten teacher I know, her son donated all of his toys to her. And when he did, she had to go through and pull out all of his plastic bundles. You can't have plastic knives and swords and axes in a kindergarten classroom. What is it that we're afraid that this young man is going to do with this young I mean, really, you know? But here we stand as a testament to the fact that you can't go like this. Yeah, well, that's the case. You can't roughhouse on the playground. No, I'm not advocating for rules. 